We're into session seven. And it seems like we just started. This covers actually quite a bit of territory, and we may not be able to get all of it done this evening. By the time I was finished with the uh, lesson last night, by the time I was finished with it, it was up to 70 slides, and we normally only do about 40 to 45 total slides. So this may go a little long, but I won't make it go too long. And if it gets into overtime, then we'll shut it down and pick it up again in the next week. But uh, this is going to talk a lot about Jesus' authority. And one of the main things and one of the main emphasis in uh, John chapter 5 that we're going to be talking about is the reason Jesus came to the earth. He makes no bones about it. He makes absolutely uh, no excuses or anything else. He simply says, I came to do the Father's will. And that's exactly what he came to do. That's what his entire life was meant for. And that's all it was meant for. And he was not going to allow anyone to detract him from that mission. Not the apostles, who obviously try that at times. Not his family, who consider him to be insane which we'll get into in future lessons. He just simply came to do his father's work and complete the works of God. Picking up from last session where Jesus had healed on the Sabbath and also set the record straight on the purpose of the Sabbath, the Jews sought all the more to kill him. Not only had he broken the Sabbath, according to their own laws, not according to God's laws, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So there are a lot of people today that still consider us making ourselves equal with God when I say that I am a son of the Most High God. I'm not saying that I'm equal with God, but I know that I am his son. I am below him. Pick it up in John 5, 19. Then answered Jesus and said to them, the Jews that were at the temple causing him problems, verily, verily, again, remember, we went over about verily, verily. If he says verily, verily, in other words, he's saying, this I know to be true because it was created by God, it was created by me. I say to you, the Son can do nothing for himself but what he sees the Father do. For what things soever he does, these also does the Son likewise. So whatever it is that the Father is doing, that's what the Son is doing as well. What is the Father doing? The Father is trying to make it to where his creation, his people can connect back to him. That's his entire purpose. He's trying to get men back up with him. And that's what Jesus is here to do to reconnect us to the Father. The Son can have no separate interest or action from the Father. For the Father loves the Son. I mean, that should be abundantly obvious. We also know that being sons of God, that he does love us. Abundantly. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that himself does. All of creation. Jesus was there from the beginning. He watched as he, well, he was the word that God was speaking forth and saying all these things created, the entire universe, all the stars, all the worlds, all the angels of all creation, Jesus was there to see. And he will show him greater works than these, that you, speaking to the Jews of the temple, may marvel. They had just seen him heal a man who had been crippled for 38 years but yet they would see greater marvels than that. For as the Father raises up the dead, lifeless bones, and quickens them, in other words, he puts the life back into those lifeless bones. That's when we get our new bodies at the resurrection. Even so, the Son quickens whom he will. A lot of people misunderstand that passage. In other words, it sounds like it's whoever he decides or chooses. No, it's whoever chooses him. Amen. 
Through salvation, eternal spiritual life and resurrected physical life are both in view here. For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honors not the Son honors not the Father which has sent him. There are many in this age today that do not honor the Son, but simply only consider him to be a good man or a prophet. The religious people who say they worship God, but deny the deity of Christ, neither have the Father or the Son. Here we go again. Verily, 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 I say to you, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life. You're never going to die. Never. He gives you all of eternity. He gives you this little time here to get ready for it. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. That's the spiritual part of it when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and get baptized. You have been pa passed from the spiritual death that you've been walking in in this life into his life. Again, verily, verily, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that sh hear shall live. We will experience it in the future physically, but we experience it now spiritually. For as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself. In other words, the Father and the Son have life naturally, we have it given to us, and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Everyone that went to the grave will hear his voice, whether we're in heaven waiting on him or... Uh, unfortunately the ones that uh, went in the other direction, and shall come forth they that have done good to the resurrection of life and they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. We've got lots of people that fall in that last category there that we're continuing to try to reach day in and day out. And we show by the way we live that our way is much better than the way that they're living. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Jesus' point was that he could not do anything independent of the Father because of his submission, his complete submission to him. His judgment is the result of listening to his Father. His judgment is just because the desire for self-glory does not taint it. The Son's will is totally to advance the Father's will. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. What that means is if you got went to a court of law and they put you up on the stand to testify for yourself, that's not going to carry any weight. They need others to testify for you so that you have more weight to your own testimony. There is another that bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. Jesus meant that the truthfulness of his claims about himself did not rest on his own testimony exclusively, even though it should. Jesus had said that he only said and did what the Father said and did. Therefore, Jesus' witness about himself must reflect the Father's witness about him. The other that bore witness about Jesus is the Father. He viewed his own witness as simply an extension of the Father's witness, since he always faithfully re uh, represented the Father's will. You sent John, 
and he bears witness to the truth. Jesus cites now a human, another human witness who testified to his identity, namely John the Baptist. But if I receive not, but I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that you might be saved. Jesus did not need or accept human testimony to establish his identity. All the witness he needed was the Father's. He only mentioned John the Baptist to establish his identity in his hearers' minds that they might believe on him and obtain salvation. But we know that they didn't even listen to that. He was a burning, talking about John, he was a burning and shining light, and you were willing for a season, in other words, for a short time, you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father has sent me. The works performed by the Savior were the very ones which were prophesied in the Old Testament concerning the Messiah. And for the Jews that understood what was being talked about in the Old Testament, they were the ones who were looking for the prophet that was coming, for the Messiah that was coming. That's the reason why his apostles came and said, this is the one that Moses wrote about. They had the belief and understanding. They read the scriptures with spiritual eyes. In other words, they didn't just read the scriptures and try to follow all the laws in order to get by and say, I'm saved. That's not what they were doing. They actually read the scriptures and got the understanding that there was one to come, that there was one greater to come. And the Father himself which has sent me has borne witness of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time talking to these people because they hadn't heard his voice. They weren't there in the desert when the uh, tabernacle was set up and they had a a uh, pillar of smoke during the day and a pillar of fire at night and God talking to Moses at all times. They didn't have that opportunity. And you have not his word abiding in you for whom he has sent him you believe not. Jesus came and they don't believe him. The unbelieving Jews had neither heard the voice of God at any time nor seen his form. This was because they did not have his word abiding in them. God speaks to men through his word, the Bible. These Jews had the Old Testament scriptures, but they did not allow God to speak to them through the scriptures. Their hearts were hardened and their ears were dull of hearing. And he tells them, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. In other words, they are the, are the scriptures which testify of me. The Jewish leaders of Jesus' day were serious students of the Old Testament. Talking about the Jewish leaders, not the unbelievers. The Jewish leaders of Jesus' day were serious students of the Old Testament, but they studied to, to earn but they studied to earn eternal life through their own efforts. The study of Scripture had become an end in itself rather than a way of getting to know God better. Their failure to recognize Jesus as the Messiah testified to their lack of perceiving, perceiving the true message of Scripture. And you will not come to me that you might have life. And you can tell by the way Jesus is saying this, he is saddened. I mean, it is weighing heavy on him because these are his people. These are the ones that he has sent to first before the Gentiles. I receive not honor or praise from men, but I know you that you have not the love of God in you. It is not possible to have God's love in you when you reject the truth of the word. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. 
Even the Antichrist will come in his own name and will be received of those who reject the word of God. How can you believe which receive honor of one another and seek not the honor that comes from God alone? In other words, these men are more concerned about seeking honor one from another about all the things that they learn in the way that they run their religiosity rather than seeking the honor that comes from God alone. Jesus' critics would not believe on him because they preferred the praise of men to the praise of God. They consistently chose what was popular over what was true. In contrast, Jesus lived solely for God's glory and did not pander to the praise of people. Amen? Amen. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There's one that accuses you already, Moses, in whom you trust. For had you believed Moses and what he had written, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? So there's a lot of people who go, well, what was it that Moses wrote? Yeah, see, I had the same question. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. The Torah is what it's referred to as. And the very first thing that was prophesied in there is that the Messiah would be the seed of a woman out of Genesis 3.15. God speaking to the serpent in the garden, he said, I will put hostility between you, Satan, and the woman. That would become Mary. And between your seed, the wicked non-believers, and her seed, Jesus, the church shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And we've been bruising his head ever since. In Romans 16, 20, it said, And God of the peace shall bruise Satan under your feet, speaking to the, uh, I think that was the Galatians, I can't remember. The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And then Galatians 4, 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, and made under the law. And spoken about in Revelation 12, 9 and 12, 17. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And the dragon was angry. He was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's you. And he continues to war with us. Always understand, you're at war. The Messiah would be a descendant of Abraham through whom all the world would be blessed. God speaking to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3 said, And I will bless them that bless you and curse him that curses you. Very plain spoken. Why they don't understand that today, I don't know, because every time they go into Israel to try to divide it up, it creates problems here in the U.S., you have to look for them to see this, all the spiritual problems that it creates. And you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. The bless, blessing is both spiritual, which was Jesus, and material. He blesses us through and through. He says to seek the kingdom first because that's where your love is supposed to be, and then he'll add all the other stuff to you. In Acts 3, 24 to 26, Luke here relates Peter's exhortation to the Jews, yes, and all the prophets from Samuel, and those that follow after, as many as they have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. In other words, the day when Jesus would come. You are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed, to you first God have raised up, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you 
in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. He wanted to turn them all away from their sins. They didn't exactly accept that. That's the reason why the Gentiles were brought in, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. The Messiah would be a willing sacrifice. This one's a little longer. This is also out of Genesis, all of chapter 22, and I'll summarize most of it. God testing Abraham sent him to Mount Moriah to offer his son Isaac as a burnt offering. This was a type and shadow of the final sacrifice to come. God told Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Then on the third day, on the third day, type and shadow of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was in the belly of the earth three days. It took three days for him to get to the mountain. Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son, Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. And Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood. Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. Then, just as Abraham was about to sacrifice his son, God called out for him to stop. Abraham saw a ram in, with his horns caught in a thicket. He sacrificed the ram instead of Isaac. Then we read, so Abraham called the, the place Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Isaiah also wrote about someone who, like Isaac, would not resist the sentence of death. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And then some 700 years later, another prophet, John the Baptist, said of Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God provided a ram to rescue Isaac from physical death, but he provided Jesus the lamb to rescue us from spiritual death and eternal separation from God. John 3.16 puts it this way, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Messiah, the one to whom the scepter belongs. That's in Genesis 49, Jacob's prophecy. In Genesis 49, 10, the scepter, which is the rod of iron, shall not depart from Judah. And Jesus was a part of the tribe of Judah, nor a lawgiver between his feet until Shiloh, which is the prince of peace, come. And to him, the gathering of the people. In Matthew 2, 6, it talks about this. And you, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of you shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. John 1, 45. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Revelation 11:15, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, "The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever." He is the Passover Lamb. The Lord gave detailed instructions to Moses and Aaron on how to prepare for the Passover. The lamb, of course, is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. The lamb is without the lamb is to be without blemish, a male of the first year, kept until the fourteenth day of the month, killed by the congregation of Israel, as was Jesus. He was killed by the congregation of Israel, just as Christ was taken by wicked hands and slain. 
killed at twilight, that's when the lamb was to be slain, killed at twi twilight between the ninth and eleven hours, just as Jesus was killed at the ninth hour, as told about in Matthew 27. Its blood was to be applied to the door, bringing salvation from the destroyer, the angel that God was sending to kill the firstborn of all those that failed to put the blood on the door. Just as the blood of Christ appropriated by our faith brings salvation from sin, self, and Satan, the flesh of the lamb was to be roasted with, with fire, like as a burnt offering, and not a bone of the lamb was to be broken. It was to be completely eaten with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. We should live lives of sincerity and truth and with the true repentance, always remembering the bitterness of Christ's suffering. And it talks about it in John 1, The next day John sees, sees Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, 1933. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead, this is at the very end when he's already crucified already, they broke not his legs. Verse 36, for these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. Everything that Jesus came to do was already foretold. And when he talks about getting the works of his father done, that's exactly what he's talking about. He's talking about all the things that were foretold of him coming, he was going to complete to the very last detail. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8, Purge out therefore the old leaven that you may ha be a new lump, talking about you, as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wit wickedness, but with the unleavened of sincerity and truth. The Messiah would be lifted up. Talked about in Numbers 21. Talking about the bronze serpent in Numbers 21, starting at Verse 4, and they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. In other words, it was rough going. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Yes, people spoke against God. And against Moses, wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our souls loathe this light bread. In other words, they were complaining about the manna. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the, among the people, and they bit the people, and much of the people of Israel died. Now you kindle the anger of God, he's going to send you a response. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned, you know, duh. We have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make you a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten when he looks upon it shall live. In other words, he wasn't going to make it easy for them. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a certain had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. The problem was that serpent of brass became an object of worship to some of them to where they had to destroy eventually that brass serpent. And Moses lifted up the servant. This is now John 3, 14 through 18, where it talks about it again. And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. His main purpose. 
He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And the wrath of God dwells in all those that refuse to accept that truth. The Messiah would be the star coming out of Jacob. Balaam, speaking parables according to God's will, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not near. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. Second Peter 1.19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, where to you do well that you take heed as to a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rises in your hearts. Revelation 22.16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches, I have sent my angel to testify to you the things in the churches. In other words, when he sent his angels out back during the time of the seven churches at Ephesus and several other places, I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. He was wanting to make sure that they understood this is who I am. The Messiah would be a prophet like Moses. That's out of Deuteronomy 18. Moses, speaking as God instructs, the Lord our, your God will raise up to you a prophet from the midst of you, in other words, a human, of your brothers like me. To, tell, to him you shall hearken. According to all that you desired of the Lord, your God in Horeb, in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. In other words, they didn't want to hear that voice because it scared them. And they didn't want to see that fire, that pillar of fire, because that scared them also. Reminds me of today's snowflakes. And the Lord said to me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brothers, an Israelite, like you, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken to my words which he will speak in my name, I will require it of him. I will require it of him. That sounds kind of, you know, eh, you know, I'll require it of him. No, what that means is you fail to listen to what he's saying. You're going to die and live in a place that you really don't want to be. In John 121, the Jews and Levites asked John the Baptist, what then, are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you that prophet, that prophet we've been waiting for? And he answered, no. John 1, 25, and they asked him and said, why baptize you then if you are not the Christ or Elias, neither that prophet? John 6, 14, then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. There were people out there that were smart enough to know that this is the man that was being talked about by Moses throughout the scriptures. For Moses truly said in Acts 3.22, for Moses truly said to the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up to you of your brothers like me. Him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say to you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. It can't get any clearer than that. And then they go through and they also added a bunch of things in here that had to do with the likeness between Moses and Jesus. There are many teach that those passages mean all of the prophets that were sent out by God. But 
none of those prophets other than Jesus Christ was like Moses in all the ways that Moses had been brought up. Both of them survived infanticide that was perpetrated by a ruler who ordered all Hebrew boys killed. They set aside their privilege and position to identify with their suffering, suffering people. They instructed God's people concerning how to escape the plague of death. They were rejected by those they came to serve. Provided water from an unusual source, Seth offered to take the punishment for Israel's sin, and above all, they were God's instruments to set his people free. Amen? Amen. All right, I know that was a lot to pack in there at one time, but you get the understanding. Jesus was foretold in the Old Testament in numerous ways. That's the reason why God takes no pleasure in all these Orthodox Jews now that will only look at the Old Testament and the Torah and still do not believe that Jesus Christ was the one that was sent. Jesus Christ is the only one. Jesus himself is the only one in history that has fulfilled all of the prophecies that were in the book. So for them to say that he's not it, so we're going to continue to wait for a Messiah to come. We've got all these Jews in this world right now that are still waiting for the, first, for the Messiah to come on the scene for the first time. Bless their hearts. I hope they get a revelation. I truly hope they do. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. That's out of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew's going to be the lead. And it came to pass on the second Sabbath... At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were hungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat, rubbing them in their hands. How many of you ever plucked fresh corn off the stalk and rubbed it in your hands to get the silk off and start eating? Oh, that's good stuff. <laughs> but when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Behold, your disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. And it talks about the day of rest in Exodus 20. But Jesus said to them, have you not read? I like it when he says that. You know, do you even read the Bible? Do you even read the Torah? Have you not read what David did? And what David did is in 1 Samuel 21. When he was hungry, and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, and did eat the showbread and gave also to them that were with him, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them that were with him, but only for the priests. It was not lawful for him to do it, but God didn't condemn it, him for it because he was on the run from somebody that was coming against him. Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath day the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless. Well, now why would that be? Because the priests must work in order to maintain the temple. And they're considered to be blameless because they're maintaining and doing something for God. But I say to you that in this place is one greater than the temple, speaking of himself, as spoken of in Malachi 3, 1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, said the Lord of hosts. Another one that was fulfilled. But if you had known what this meant... I will have mercy and not sacrifice. We went over this last week. There's some things that he repeats in places. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the guiltless. In Hosea 6.6, 6, it talks about this. For I desired mercy, God speaking, for I desired mercy, that people have mercy. I don't care so much about the sacrifice. I consider more about mercy. I want mercy and not sacrifice. And the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. He wants to have a relationship with you. Amen? 
And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. In other words, it was meant to be a day of rest, to rest your weary bones. He said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. God didn't create man to have Sabbath so that they would follow all these rules about him. That's not what he created. He created the Sabbath for men. Here's a day of rest to commune with me. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. And then there was a man with a withered hand. That's in Matthew 12, 9 through 14. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath... When he was departed from there, he went into their synagogue, and behold, there was a man with, which had his hand withered. Now, this is one of the few times that you'll see that they actually said Jesus was angry. There was a man which had his hand withered. Well, of course, you also remember the time that he formed the little whip and you know, drove out all of the money changers. The scribes and the Pharisees watched him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might be able to accuse him? And he said to them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not hold on to it and lift it out? Well, of course, because that sheep means money to him. I mean, you know, that's where God, what God talks about, where your heart is, is where your money is. Will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Then said Jesus to them, I will ask you one thing. Wherefore it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace and wouldn't talk. And that was probably better for them. Then said he to the man which had the withered hand, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, and the word used for anger there means he was seething. He was hot. Being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he says to the man, stretch forth your hand, and he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole, like as the other. And they, the, the ones in the temple, the, the leaders in the temple, they were filled with madness. They went off their rocker. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council with the Herodians. Y'all remember the Herodians, the ones they hate, but you know, uh, enemy of my enemy is my friend, against him, how they might destroy him. This is God's chosen servant, starts in Matthew chapter 12. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from there with his disciples to the sea. And great multitudes followed him because, you know, when you see some people getting healed, you want to run out and find all the people you know that are sick and have limbs that have problems. You want to run out and grab them and get them to Jesus so that they can get their healing. From Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and from beyond the Jordan, and they about Tyre and Sidon, when they had heard what great things he did, came to him. And he spoke to his disciples that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude, lest they should throng him. For he had healed many insomuch that they pressed upon him to touch him. And as many as had plagues, he healed them all. No matter what, he stayed there long enough to heal them all. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, You are the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah, the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, 
and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment to victory, and in his name shall the Gentiles trust. And I apologize for not getting that completed. I intended to go back and get that, uh, get the explanations put in on that one. Jesus selects 12 disciples. Now everybody's sitting here going, well, didn't he already select them? No. The only thing that he's been doing has been gathering up disciples. Now the only ones that it talks about are the ones that he's actually going to select. But he had a multitude of disciples that were following him at this time. Mark 3, picking up in verse 13, and it came to pass in those days he goes up into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called to him his disciples, whom he would, and they came to him. And of them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that, they, that he might send them forth to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. Now, a lot of people teach that that means that only these apostles have that authority and power. The reason why Jesus gave them the power is because he's here on the earth right now at this time and has not gone to the Father yet. He has not been uh, gone through the cruc crucifixion and risen up in his power and sent back the Holy Spirit. It's once that Holy Spirit is sent back, we all have the same authority. So don't let people teach you otherwise. This was only meant to be a stopgap thing until he is glorified. And Simon, he surnamed Peter, and James, the son of Zebedee, and, the, and John, the brother of James, and he surnamed them Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder. And Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Judas, whose name, surname was Thaddeus, and Simon called Zelotes the Canaanite. In other words, you're seeing Gentiles mixed in with these Jews. And Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and they went into a house. And you have much to consider. It was just getting good, wasn't it? <laughs> You're into it more. You, you've probably gotten more in just these seven sessions or eight sessions, actually, than what most people get in seven years of uh, sitting in and just listening to a, uh, a sermon. Don't get me wrong, sermons are good, but you're not going to get all of your food there. That's the reason why it's required of you to take the time and come and learn more. Amen. Amen. All right, any questions over what we've covered? Yes. And it, that is correct. What the word, you have to understand Old English when it's used had a different meaning and intensity at the time that the New King or the King James was written. That's the reason why most of the time we need to take and change those words because that's like when they say hope. Hope today means it's like a wish. Hope in the Bible, the way in the words that are used, means it's going to happen. In other words, we have a hope in what's going to happen. It's an assurity, not a wish that it might happen. So it says it should. That, that's the reason why you see what I do on the slides. I go through there. There are some things I miss because this is an intense study even for me. 
when you're going through it. The should, he is. That it, it, it is a def definitive, it is going to happen. That, that's the reason why I don't like some of the... Uh, Satan has been extremely successful in his ability to diminish words, such as love. We love ice cream. We love our cars. God never intended the word love to mean anything else than between, you know, I love my brothers and sisters. I love my father more than anything in this universe. But when you say that, you know, that's the same thing as loving ice cream, no. That's th so, like I said, Satan has been very successful over the years of taking words, including hope, and changing their connotation to something that was not meant at the time that they wrote the King James Version. So that's the reason why it's important for us now to go and look at what the original Hebrew said and what it meant. And that word for should means will, shall happen. Exactly. Another question I had, and I know you've uh, explained this before, but I, I forgot. When you say bruise his head and bruise his Okay, the church will bruise his head. Jesus, w the woman also bruised his head by the fact that she brought Jesus in to the world, which he was trying to prevent from happening. Bruising his head is more deadly than bruising the heel. Bruising the heel is something that's minor. That's all he can do is nip at your heel. Whereas the head, though, when you hit that head, you bring them down. That's the reason why we have the authority. He might nip at our heels. We just kind of shake that off, and then we stomp on his head because that brings damage to him and brings him down. We have to continue to understand that no matter how many times he nips us on the heel, we just shake it off because nipping on the heel is a much lesser damage to us. He can't do anything to us. He can't send us to an eternity in hell with him. I mean, all he can try to do is stop us from being Christians on this earth and bringing God's word forth. That's what he, that is the biggest thing that he wants to stop. He wants you to stop being those that carry the good news forward and continue to show that God is more powerful than anything that he can possibly do. Amen. Amen.